Hi, I'm Liz Homer. I'm the curator of the Turner Dodge House. And tonight for our Meet Your City program, we're going to be talking about labor history. The purpose of the Meet Your City program is to acquaint you, our viewers, with our local history primarily. But of course, part of our local history is our uh, labor history. And so when I was speaking with John Rivette, I asked him, um, what is the importance of, the, of labor? Why did it form? Why is it needed? And um, what are some of the forces that oppose uh, labor as an organized uh, union, and um, and why? And that got us into the idea of uh, of uh, labor's political history. And so tonight, that's what he's going to be talking about. John is a professor of uh, of labor studies at Michigan State University. He's been involved with history for some 27 years. He's produced many booklets about Detroit and Michigan labor history and many excellent videos. And uh, so tonight I'll turn it over to him and he can give us uh, um, an introduction at least to Michigan's uh, labor union history involving politics. And then later in July we'll have another program by Dr. Uh, Lisa Fine who will talk about uh, particularly a new book she's written called Rio Joe, which will focus on Rio and Lansing's local history. Thanks, Liz. I appreciate the opportunity to talk tonight about the history of Michigan unions and their involvement in politics. Uh, as you mentioned, I've been involved in doing some interviews and making some uh, booklets. Uh, I had the privilege of doing a booklet and a video uh, about the history of unions in the state of Michigan with a colleague almost 20 years ago called From Calumet to Kalamazoo and it was the story of workers and unions in various industries from 1818 to today and we did that booklet and uh, and made a video which Michigan State makes available uh, for a small $25 fee and like you said I did some projects uh, in Detroit too about the history of uh, unions in Detroit and was involved with several videos and actually a much larger book called Working Detroit one of the topics in uh, doing that, and I was often involved with doing interviews with people. Um, usually I like to interview people when they've retired. Um, it's a little easier for them to speak more freely. Uh, and in those earlier projects, often the questions were, where did they first go to work and what kind of conditions did they find and what was it about work that got them thinking about unionizing or, you know, maybe just started by complaining about working conditions not being as good or maybe uh, something about pay and then maybe they got more involved in the union and they go on and maybe make a career of it and so when they would finished that career I'd ask them if I could interview them so I've done uh, maybe a hundred uh, different interviews of different people over the time and one of the topics that came up often um, and in one of the videos and if we have time later maybe we'll show just a couple minutes of the from Calumet uh, was the issue about politics. Uh, many union people would make comments about, well, it was kind of a famous phrase of Walter Ruther, one of the most famous and the, and the longest uh, president of the United Auto Workers headquartered here in Michigan and Detroit. And Ruther often made the point uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, up to 70, uh, when he died, in the 50s and 60s, let me say, that what you want at the bargaining table, what benefits you won might be lost at the ballot box. Uh, he said it a couple different ways, but his, but his point was that you could negotiate with the employer and you could improve the wages and you could make the working conditions better and safer. Uh, you could add all kinds of brand new benefits which workers didn't have before, whether that's pensions or paid holidays, quite a variety of different things. But that some of those could be lost by what happened in Congress or what happened in the state legislature lost in, in several ways. Ruther might comment that it might be lost and that some of the union's power might be uh, affected by the laws and what rights workers had to form or join unions. It wasn't until 1935, for example, that workers uh, working from the private sector for the for-profit companies, whether it's GM or uh, Ford or somebody else, uh, had the right to form or join unions. So that only came with a political change in America giving workers a right to form or join unions under Franklin Roosevelt, part of the New Deal, called the Wagner Act. Similarly, for state employees in the state of Michigan, 
the right for public employees to form or join unions only occurred in 1964 uh, when the Public Employment Relations Act of Michigan was passed. So Bertha might comment that partly just your right to have a union or what the union can do is based on that. But he, I think, was also saying that unions can do some things at the bargaining table, but they really can't meet all of the members' needs, and they can't meet community needs, uh, they can't affect schools or, or other things that are part of people's lives. And so I think he was also saying that that was part of it. And he was one of Michigan's most famous labor leaders. Jimmy Hoffa was another, uh, Myra Wolfgang. We could go on and talk about uh, many people. Millie Jeffrey, who just recently passed away, was one of those very famous uh, she was auto workers, uh, union leaders who got very involved in politics. And so doing interviews uh, both with um, labor leaders and also with politicians led me to, to say maybe we should do a new show, probably something a new kind of show on a CD-ROM, uh, something maybe available through the, the internet. And so I've been working in the last year to kind of go back and try to capture more visuals, more um, audio, both of interviewing people, but also we have some president's uh, voices, we have some famous labor leader voices, and so I'm in the process really of just starting to create a new show. And um, I get teased about how long is it going to take Professor to do this, because I've been showing this kind of as it's developing for almost a year now, and some people say, you know, why can't you get that done next week or something? And, sell it and have it available and, and I try to say well I'm still interviewing people and and there are still books I need to read there's there's uh -huh. still there's still uh, documents that that I need to collect whether they're documents by political parties or documents that unions develop and so it's still a process of of learning some things and I was Please, when you ask me would I be part of this show, to sort of show an in progress. So I do hope in a year or whatever it does take to sort of get this to a finished product that I get invited back or, oh, yeah. or something that we can, do, we can do something about that. So mm -hmm. what I was going to do is I have um, some visuals um, uh, that uh, focus in on Michigan work and also fit, focus in on, on political activities. And I have uh, also some um, video footage uh, from doing some interviews and uh, uh, some conferences with some labor people and politicians. And we'll kind of see the pieces that in the future will, will be developed, but they aren't really quite there yet. If I could just show one other thing over here. Um, in the show we will see some um, memorabilia, some documents like I was describing, some cartoons, because uh, I think uh, cartoons are particularly uh, telling and, 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 and reveal much about society and, and, and about how people feel about items. And so there's, there's some of those. And also some buttons. Uh, it seems that one of the things that the labor movement has enjoyed is, is uh, showing buttons uh, about people's attitudes. I'm not a big button collector like there are some other people. Uh, Harry Emmons, for example, here in town, uh, here in Lansing, has quite a button collection. And there's some other people, Oscar Pascal in Detroit, who have enormous collections. But I have a few. My oldest political one is, is one that was by uh, the CIO, uh, which the UAW was part of, and its political action committee, and it's an FDR button that says OK. And it's uh, one of FDR's re-election campaigns. I, I think this is the 1940 campaign. That's part of the research that I'm, that I'm still doing. So there's some that go back, you know, quite a ways. Uh, before buttons, there were little placards and, and, and standards that people had. Um, and in the vi visuals, we'll see some. But I brought a couple. Um, campaigns that maybe some people will remember. Um, Mondale and, and, and Ferraro, uh, uh, one of the Times Labor Bank, someone who wasn't successful in the 1984 uh, Reagan re-election. Or in a primary, some labor people got for uh, labor for Tom Harkin, and he was supported by some of the unions. 
or even just in the most recent campaign, uh, AFSCME was one of several unions that backed Dean, uh, who is not the, uh, the eventual uh, Democratic candidate uh, likely to, to be out there. So that has been something that's been, you know, part of the labor scene nationally as well as in Michigan. And in terms of Michigan, some of the viewers will probably remember a gentleman named Zoltan Ferency, who was a Michigan State University professor, one time the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party, who ran for governor uh, in the state of Michigan at a time when he was somewhat close to many in the labor movement. A little later, he was not on the same side with some in the labor movement, disagreeing about certain things. But in the reality, and that's part of what I'm trying to do with this show, is we have a certain vision, I think, about labor and politics. And I think this button kind of demonstrates what that is today. And this says, vote straight Democratic. I think there's a lot of people that pretty much assume that unions are about the same as the Democratic Party, that, that there isn't much difference and that there's a lot, of, a lot of unity. And of course, there are many in the Democratic Party who are quite close to labor, and there are many in labor quite close to the Democrats. But it gets more complicated than that, and I guess that's part of the job of a professor as you kind of start raising that. So one way you can raise that is the reality that even just in our recent gubernatorial elections, we had some labor people who were very strongly for Dave Bonnier, who had been a former congressperson and close to many in labor, but other labor people were supportive of the eventual nominee, Jennifer Granholm, our governor now. And there was a split. Not all the unions went one way or the other. But we do have this sort of image that, uh, that labor has is, 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 is only been sort of with the Democratic Party. And one of the fascinating things about doing a research project is you find out some of those common sense or, or commonly believed things are true and others are not quite that way. And so in doing this project, one of the things that fascinated me was realizing when you really look back at Michigan's history over a long period of time, that some of the time labor was close to Democrats. But there were some times when labor was much closer to Republicans, at least progressive Republicans. Maybe in modern terms, somebody might say a Millican Republican in, in, in our current world, but the names long ago weren't that. You would be talking about uh, somebody like a Hazen Pingree a Republican or a Teddy Roosevelt progressive Republican. And many in the labor movement were quite close to, uh, to Pingree as governor, uh, first mayor of Detroit, and, and Teddy Roosevelt as, as U.S. president. Um, similarly, there were times when many of those in the labor movement thought that both the Democrats and the Republicans weren't for the working man or the working woman, and they went socialist or some other third party kind of way. And so one of the other things that the eventual show will, will kind of highlight is that kind of diversity, that variety that really exists that's existed historically, and even still, as I was commenting, really still exists today, because all of labor isn't identical to each other. Uh, they weren't in the federal primary, and they weren't in the governor's race that I mentioned. So I had some visuals, that, uh, some historic visuals that I was going to show. Um, as I say, a little later, we'll add some of the sound. Um, a little later, I can show some of the, the videotape that's very current which has sound. This first part I'll just kind of narrate. Well, like I was mentioning, I'm working on creating a new show, and at this point it's a series of PowerPoints, and um, the topic is labor and politics, and looking at the, the state uh, from the beginning, and the early mechanic society, and a state that didn't even seem to include the Upper Peninsula, uh, in terms of how some of the math did it, doers uh, went. Early strikes, takes us labor involved in traditional early newspaper, first union paper. Uh, both of these are Detroit. Um, Why'd they but call it the rat? Because that um, <laughs> had to do with the people who were working, who might have been members of the Detroit Typographical Society, which is what the journeyman printers called their union. They were kind of afraid of being called a union that they'd get in trouble, so they called themselves a Detroit Typographical Society. Um, another group called themselves the Washington Literary Society. Uh, but these were early <laughs> union groups. 
the rant was a list of some of their members that worked even though there was a labor dispute going on. And so that phrase still exists and you can see rant signs sometimes at building construction sites today. But also people were involved in labor issues politically and concerned about the variety of conditions, whether people were working in an early uh, railroad area or Detroit was very big shipbuilding. Uh, many people don't realize just how much we were. And there were women workers uh, from the beginning of Michigan here uh, packing table salt. Um, and there were some uh, even in school, and MSU was one of those that kind of was dedicated to the working kind of issues. The Knights of Labor was our big kind of labor group. Uh, this notion of hear both sides then judge was the radical slogan of the day. It sounds pretty modest today. Mm -hmm. This gentleman was one of the Knights of Labor leaders who got involved in politics. And his name is Thomas Berry. And this shows us, uh, this is from a ledger of politicians in office in Michigan in the 1880s. Uh, it tells you a little bit about where he, how he got to Saginaw County. And um, the, the last lines, I think, are kind of interesting because they tell you that he won the nomination of the Greenback uh, uh, and Democratic parties in addition to the Labor Party and beat the Republican and the Prohibitionist. Uh, so that kind of lets us know the kind of subjects that people were interested in back at that time. Uh, he was very instrumental in pushing this 10-hour day law for the uh, sawmill workers. And as I say, he was connected with the, with the Knights of Labor. That was a big dodge. What's that? Frank Dodge was involved with the, uh, uh, he was uh, the attorney for the Knights of Labor in that strike. And the strike was centered in the Saginaw Valley, uh, mm -hmm. town Saginaw, Bay City, but actually parts of the strike went all the way to the Oscoda, uh, Sabo, and uh, over to Muskegon. Um, and a big part of the strike was the issue about the 10 hour day because uh, there was a new state law to take effect and some of the employers weren't doing it and uh, the Knights of Labor got involved and there was also anger about Pinkerton's detective agents getting involved in the, uh, in the dispute. So this newspaper from uh, uh, Saginaw County of 1885 tells us a little about the issue that concerned these uh, sawmill workers um, in terms of trying to get a 10-hour day. Another major issue for the Knights in politics was creating a Department of Labor. It was originally called the Bureau of Labor and Industrial Statistics, created in 1883. And uh, in this, uh, if I can get this to stop moving here, um, it tells us that the governor thought that this was a necessary and useful idea, and I'll read some of it. Railroads and insurance, corrections and charities, education, agriculture, and health have been committed to state boards whose valuable statistics and suggestions form the basis for legislation. Paupers and criminals, the fish that swim in our rivers and lakes, and the cattle that graze in our fields are cared for by commissioners appointed by the state. A large class of our citizens, and who are seldom found in the halls of legislation to speak for themselves, have no one whose special duty it is to investigate their condition and report what legislation is necessary for the protection of their interest. I refer to the laboring class. And it goes on and says Massachusetts has mm -hmm. created one of these Bureau of Labor Statistics to look at some of the issues, to, to, to visit factories, uh, as it goes on and says, to see if there are abuses uh, that might be the basis upon legislation. It's a kind of eloquent statement about the fact that we did look at fishes and rivers and paupers and before we started talking about the, the working people. So that was one of the early issues that took labor unions outside of just the kind of specific collective bargaining, forming unions, um, to, to try to better their, their, their conditions, um, which of course, the early Michigan were, were fairly uh, rudimentary. One of the issues that concerned him is what you see in the first rows of that picture that moved too quick on us. And we can see that there are some children uh, in this work group. Michigan was not as bad as New England, uh, New York, in terms of the amount of child labor. 
partly because of the different industries that we had here. We didn't have the garment trades as much, and, and uh, our mining didn't use them as much, but we had some. And uh, I I've, I've, don't have it in the show, but I have kind of went through a couple of the years of those labor department, the bureau becomes a department later, it's statistics, and it told, tells us exactly at um, Park Davis how many of the employees were women, how many were children, what ages they were. Some years they investigate and they tell us uh, what languages they speak or even such things as um, whether or not there were musical instruments in the homes, uh, whether they subscribed to newspapers. It was kind of a different kind of statistics than we would do today. But in this picture, it, it, this is actually Lansing. It's a Lansing chair company uh, about 120 years ago. I keep doing a double take trying to figure out is one of these an older man and one's a child or are they both yeah. young yeah. adults or are they both older teens? You, you almost can't tell. Is it a father and son? It, it, it might be. But there's something about that that's kind of revealing. The Knights of Labor did not last for, for a long time. It, it, it had some success, like I mentioned, in getting the Bureau of Labor Statistics, turning some focus on child labor. Uh, but it, it didn't last as long. Uh, instead, the, the National AFL um, helped create a Michigan Federation of Labor that existed from 1889 to 1958 when it merged with the Michigan CIO. And uh, uh, this handshake I find interesting because it kind of becomes a symbol for a long time mm -hmm. among labor people. Later as kind of an AFL-CIO gripper. I wondered here if it was Upper Peninsula and Lower Peninsula. Um, but again, it's kind of interesting. Not much of the Upper Peninsula is in this, uh, in this visual. Um, the AFL and the Michigan Federation of Labor um, felt very much under fire and very cautious or prudential. Um, and partly it was the kind of attacks that were made in the press and, and, and sometimes on picket lines. Um, and one of those attacks was on this gentleman in the picture who's on uh, our far left, uh, Sam Gompers, it says on, on his name tag. He was the president of the American Federation of Labor from 1881 until his death in the early 20s all except for one year. He was voted out of office one year over a fight about politics, actually, at the convention. He was very famous for a statement about what does labor want and wants more. And the press played it up as kind of a negative that labor just wants more, 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 more. The real phrase was labor wants more schools, less prisons. Labor wants, you know, more kindness, less hostility. It was, you know, it was a very gentle kind of statement, but it didn't get played that way. Well, this cartoonist uh, from a progressive uh, publication uh, seems to have, have kind of thought differently about it. And if you look at this carefully, if you start at the far right, you have a um, basic uh, everyday worker. Um, he's got his coat uh, over his hand. He's carrying his own shovel. He makes a dollar a day and he would like an increase of a nickel or a dime a day. Next to him is an early union member. We'll see that cap many times, that little meter cap. Mm -hmm. Many times it means the carpenter's union, but I think sometimes the cartoonist just wanted to indicate it was a union person. And he is making three dollars a day, and he'd like to make three and a quarter or three thirty. Well, next to him, I guess, is the first level of the foreman or supervisor. Uh, he's making five thousand. Dollars. Um, I assume that means a year, and he, he would like a $2,000 increase. And then a little bit higher up the chain here, uh, this gentleman is worth uh, half a million, and he'd like to be a millionaire. And then, of course, the, uh, uh, the biggest uh, pig is what's obviously being shown, is worth $50 million, and he wants the earth. Yeah. And so I, this person has kind of taken that, that famous kind of attack on Gompers and put it in a different context. But it kind of tells a story in many ways about what and how people saw the world at the time. One of the fears that many had in labor was child labor conditions, sweatshop conditions. Um, some of what we worry about today in, in the world was a big part of 100 years ago. And this is a cartoon in the Detroit Times um, of 1899. And it shows greed and bleed of New York City. And my guess is that
the cartoonist is sort of saying, we don't want in Detroit the kind of sweatshop conditions um, that they have in, in New York City or, or, or some of the other areas. But this kind of theme will come back many times in terms of what labor wants. Um, this is a, a collective bargaining, um, a little booklet for 10 cents a copy, uh, published by the American Federation of Labor. And interestingly, it's, it's saying that collective bargaining would be labor's proposal to ensure greater industrial peace. And, uh, kind of, uh, uh, in a sense, it's about bargaining, but it's kind of a political outreach in a sense, too, of this book, let's be for people who, who maybe aren't in favor of bargaining and trying to tell those in Congress. And it isn't until, like I say, 35 that where people do have a right to form or join unions. So typically, the only ones in unions were the most highly skilled. So in early Labor Day parades, like this first one in, in New York City, um, or I've got some here in Detroit, Michigan, uh, also at the turn of the century, typically the people who are there are the skilled trades, those that were so highly uh, skilled that they were hard to replace. Uh, they could afford to be union because the employer tells them, I'm going to fire you. You would say, well, okay, I'll get another job. Or you really can't because you can't do this job. Whereas the more everyday worker could easily be fired, and it wasn't really till the 1935 law giving them a right. So these early ones we have the bill posters, or here we have longshoremen. And again, it show this, and I have to remind the audience, these are really about Michigan. So this was Detroit. Uh, I think this uh, is on, um, uh, on Jefferson Avenue. Um, longshoremen was a big union in the city of Detroit for a while, 100 years ago. Uh, Joseph Lambity was the first president of the Michigan Federation of Labor. Um, he's a fairly interesting person. He, he um, moved around. At times he was with the Knights of Labor. At times he's with the Detroit Council of Trades or the Michigan Federation of Labor. Politically he moved over time. I don't think he ever was much of a Republican, but at times he was a Democrat, at times he was a Socialist and he ended as what was called the gentle anarchist who kind of felt like any government wasn't very useful for the working person. Um, but as I was mentioning earlier, workers unions in Michigan um, sometimes supported Republicans, at least Republicans supportive of rights of workers in some ways, as much as Democrats. And part of the reason for that is quite clearly because of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there was very much a sense among the working people, the mechanics, the skilled trades, um, that Lincoln was about free labor. And by opposing slave labor, that he was also made numerous statements about the positive value of, of being a free person and that citizenship was something that went with free labor. So you had union groups very supportive, like this club somewhere, of, of Lincoln. Um, this cartoonist uh, gives us another reason why, and it's an interesting cartoon. This one's also about 100 years old. Uh, the person in the middle is the popular voter, uh, as it shows. Uh, the gentleman on our right uh, is the Democrat, and the one on the left is the Republican. It's interesting what it says their promises are. The Democrats' promises is reduced taxes, which of course is kind of the opposite of what President Bush says that his likely opponent Kerry is about, uh, and, and also for cheaper living and no monopolies. The Republican promises are protectionism, protection to the home industries, higher wages. Well, it was because they were kind of trying to protect these new big industries from kind of competition with Germany and England and such, and uh, saw that they had some things in common with the skilled tradesperson, and you notice the hat that, that, that this person's wearing. Um, two things interesting, one is the woman in front, I'm not mm -hmm. sure quite what vote for Belva means. It, it may be a suffragette uh, saying that women should have the right to vote. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that that's what's going on. Yeah. The other thing that's kind of fun is, is the, the uh, shorter person, I'm not sure if he's younger or older, with the bucket. And the bucket yeah. says cold water. So he's kind of saying, you know, fooey on all you folks yeah. here. Uh, these are all promises that, that aren't going to be delivered. But we get that sense uh, in, in these times. Um, one of the most famous of the early Democrats close to, to labor was William Jennings Bryan, um, who uh, ran a couple times on a, on a program of uh, ending uh, the, um, uh, the cross of gold, the gold standard for money. 
Um, but as he says here, he was for liberty, justice, humanity, equal rights to all, special privileges to none, things that would, would, uh, would be there, um, pretty popular. He was a friend of uh, Frank Dodge's who came here and stayed in this house. Really? So he stayed in this house? Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you know, was it in which campaign? Was it the 80, I mean, the 1896 or the 1900 or? I, I'm not sure. But probably during a campaign. Yeah. That would make sense. Um, this one is, uh, Brian, this is, is the one in the sort of middle on the back of the train. Uh, Going around by train was a common way for the politicians to get around to people, uh, to, to talk to them. Uh, I like the next picture uh, uh, coming up in a second. Uh, this one is, is promising prosperity at home, prestige abroad, uh, forward civilization, citizens. Uh, this one I, I say is, is maybe the first stump speech. Uh, this is, is William Jennings Bryan standing talking to a group of workers uh, somewhere probably uh, a lumbering sort of uh, uh, operation. Um, here, um, someone has, has cartooned that Sam Gompers, is the little character on a bucket of the Bryan dinner pail, is saying all true working men would vote for Bryan um, by order of, of Sam Gompers. Um, Gompers, in fact, was fairly cautious, prudent, as I said, and often afraid of getting involved. Partly because there was a big split. Some of the labor people were Democrats, some Republicans, but others were for third parties. And Gompers therefore addressed this issue. Should a political labor party be formed? He gave this address, it says in 1918 in, in New York City. Um, because there was a lot of different parties out there that are trying to attract the working person. A National Labor Reform Party that would pick it and go around. A Greenback Labor Party bringing farmers and workers together. Um, the People's Party, or populism, which was one of the more popular and famous ones, especially a little farther west of us in the, in the Middle West. But often the common theme was what's in this kind of cartoon. They're rowing upstream. The stream was called Monopoly. In the boat is a farmer and again a kind of a union person, maybe a carpenter, maybe another. And the caption says, in the same boat, the farmer and laborer both pulling against the current of monopoly. And that's going to come up a lot in these themes. Now some believe that maybe you really had to do things much different and talked about socialism. Now socialism at that time could be an image like this hammer, uh, which almost makes people think of communism or, or something much later. Um, or it, it could be more of what this cartoon seems to, to, to talk about. Interestingly, we have the Hercules of labor saving his country. The country is Colombia. It says on her head, Colombia, which is another name for America. And she's being surrounded by a snake. And on the snake, the coils say things like, excuse me, lead, copper, tin, steel, iron. I think those are the monopolies that, 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 that are controlling. And of course, the cartoonist is saying, this is really a two-headed snake and the heads are the Republican Party and the Democratic Party because this person's pushing some kind of a labor party. Interestingly, the bottom of it, the caption though, is a government of, by, and for the people, Abraham Lincoln. So we see this kind of very interesting use of different sort of images that are being told here. The most famous of these uh, third parties was the Socialist Party of America and partly because Gene Debs uh, who came out of the railroad industry and was famous in a, tying up the railroads in a major strike, um, ran as the Socialist Party candidate four times uh, for election and came to Michigan several times, um, each one of those elections. And uh, I have audio but not with me at the moment here. It's in that From Calumet to Kalamazoo video. I used a few mm -hmm. seconds of the clip uh, of Debs actually talking. Uh, or uh, an actor playing Debs talking during this campaign. Um, and here again we have the train and this is the Debs special going around the country. Here it's visiting Detroit, Michigan in 1908, the Light Guard Armory of Brush and Larner. Interestingly, they charged 15 cents for that, which if you were that dollar a day person, that was a pretty hefty thing to go hear them, but it was a contribution obviously to a, to a political event. And uh, when you hear Deb speak, you can just, you know, you get, 
the sense of him reaching out saying that working people have to be more involved not just in building unions but politically and he was pushing that they ought to join the Socialist Party uh, but, but um, he, he, he found people that listened to him in Michigan in the 1910s uh, we had socialist mayors and magazines. Uh, this list is kind of interesting. Uh, some of these cities uh, that had socialist mayors, uh, Greenville and uh, Harbor Springs and Traverse City aren't ones that people today would think of would be likely, because we have a certain picture of what socialist means. At that time, the socialists were pushing for unemployment compensation, workers' compensation, things that you didn't have at that time, so it isn't quite the same meaning. But there were a whole series of socialist magazines, uh, some that lasted a fair amount of time, like the Ann Arbor Call, uh, the Hancock uh, Finnish paper, and then some that, quite frankly, I'd like to get a copy of. I'd like to see what the Kalamazoo Billy Goat has to say. I kind of find that a kind of an interesting name for a, for a paper. As I said earlier, there were progressives in both the Democrat and Republican side. In the Republican Party, one of the most famous of the progressives uh, was Teddy Roosevelt and uh, the eventual show I'll have some Teddy Roosevelt talking mm -hmm. uh, and why he backed some labor reforms and how he got involved and as we know he came in his campaigns to, to Michigan um, and uh, to Lansing and was um, given a ride on, on uh, one of Ari Olds' uh, original vehicles which was kind of a famous local uh, kind of lore. He was very much tied with a lot of discussion about this time the full dinner pail and so we'll see the full dinner pail many times but sometimes depicted like this one stuffed with the monopoly. This one's the Standard Oil Trust, the copper mines uh, stuffing the, that dinner pail. On the Democratic side one of the more progressive and, and supportive of trying to give labor some more rights was Woodrow Wilson and during the war he created a war labor board and a U.S. Department of Labor uh, to address issues and so this caption of the harvest years is saying labor finally reaped something but they continue to be bothered by issues like sweatshops and low pay mm -hmm. those sort of issues. Here in Michigan uh, there were Michigan governors and governor candidates both Republican and Democrats that labor found itself close to. One of the famous Republicans uh, was Hazen Pingree, who had been mayor of Detroit and then later governor of Michigan. And Hazen Pingree wrote this fascinating book uh, after um, he was uh, been mayor for a while in 1895, and it's called Facts and Opinions. And in it, it just doesn't sound like a Republican. My experience in fighting monopolistic corporations as mayor of Detroit and in endeavoring to save to the people some of their rights is against their greed have further convinced me that they, the corporations, are responsible for nearly all the thieving and blooding with which cities are made really? to suffer from their servants. They seek almost uniformly to secure what they want by means of bribes, and in this way they corrupt our councils and commissions. This just doesn't sound like our sort of notion of John Engler Republican uh, in, in modern times, but Pingree was a, it was a different time, and partly it was different issues. At that point, there wasn't anything that was sort of um, municipal, and water, heat, electricity, and trolleys were owned by private companies. Mm -hmm. And the trolley company conditions riding behind this horse for pretty high expense, especially given what people's wages were, uh, made many in Detroit quite angry. And it actually led to a riot at one point mm -hmm. um, on Woodward Avenue and people um, got so frustrated that they threw some of the trolleys in, in, into, the, into the river. And Pingree, in his book, included this cartoon which says, scenes like this are brought about by unfair treatment, but not approved by the great masses of workmen, which is probably pretty true. But he was saying that we needed to have better rights so you wouldn't have that kind of rioting against unjust corporations or he was also fearful of what this shows kind of racial and ethnic hostility in this case a group of whites chasing blacks out of town uh, which was part of the scene. Pingree was maybe most famous for during his time uh, the potato patches, the potato, the Pingree potato patches mm 
because there was a depression or recession or, or money crisis uh, during his time and he gave some city land over to people to put together their, their little potato patches. Uh, another governor who was famous and a Republican uh, progressive was Chase Osborne who had been connected to the uh, iron mining industry and um, he talked about uh, in, in his time in a book that he wrote very near to my heart I had the matter of a workman's compensation law I had given the subject considerable study in Germany and England and had talked it over often with my intimate associates and others the legislature in regular session had empowered the governor to appoint a commission to study the question and draft a form of a bill embodying a suitable law so he goes on and talks about a worker compensation law so we find things are a little more complicated than we had anticipated in terms of, of where people were. And in fact, during one of the major strikes in Michigan, uh, the Calumet and Heckler strike, it was actually a Democratic governor who happened to be in office. One of the few times we had a Democratic governor. And while he was in office, the strike occurred, and he received news uh, through this uh, uh, Western Union Telegraph uh, company, uh, 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 Telegram, that lawlessness has broken loose through the district in the Calumet area in uh, October of 1913. And so he sent the entire Michigan National Guard up to, to the area and they created Camp Michigan National Guard in Calumet, Michigan. And that Calumet to Kalamazoo video tells the story uh, and the unfortunate ending uh, for, for much of the spirit of the strikers of the tragedy of, of, of the children dying in the a uh, Christmas party when someone yeah. falsely yelled fire and they stampeded to the door. Mm -hmm. But one of the issues he had to confront was how to deal with that. The 1920s um, were pretty much bereft, absent of progressive Republicans or progressive Democrats. It was a much more conservative time and the employers really uh, utilized uh, their opportunities to truly try to eliminate what little pockets there were of those skilled trades unionism and employer associations freely advertised the notion of uh, open shops getting rid of unions uh, this is the employer association of detroit which um, became the hiring hall in effect for many detroiters in the 1920s grand rapids employers formed their association then brought together the furniture manufacturers and the others and a major goal of theirs was the notion of open shops. No unions allowed. This uh, newspaper clip from the Detroit News says it pretty well. Lake carriers will not hire mates who belong to any union. They're just not allowed. Meanwhile, working conditions were often difficult and we had you know, some real crises and we had presidents that were fairly hostile to, uh, to labor, and the federal courts were pretty hostile to even government involvement, and so federal child labor laws were held invalid by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and the status in Michigan was that the Michigan Republican Party really had control of the state. And as I told you, one exception, one two years when a Democrat was in, um, We'll have one other exception in the 30s, and otherwise it isn't until 48 that we have, with G. Men and Williams, a, a longer period of a Democrat as governor. So this cartoonist in the Detroit News uh, making comments in terms of sort of the influence of money uh, in, the Mich in the Michigan uh, GOP. Um, there were stirrings among auto workers uh, and other workers to do things different, especially when the Great Depression hit. and um, the depression meant that many people didn't have work and um, you know today we talk about six percent or seven percent unemployment and that's pretty awful and we know the official statistics don't really capture how bad it might be but the depression from 1929 to 40 it's 15 to 25 percent and so this gentleman or this family selling apples you know it was you knew many people who were unemployed doing that and so some workers and unions turned to much more radical kinds of alternatives and demonstrations. So communist socialists were attractive. Uh, communists uh, were prominent in the unemployment council. 
uh, when uh, people in Detroit in 1931, 32 were thrown out for not paying, paying their rent, uh, sometimes the unemployed council would go and put all their furniture back in the house where the landlord had just had them evicted. I mean, they did kind of those kind of funny things. And they also just sponsored enormous demonstrations and rallies uh, about the conditions. And um, as the Calumet uh, makes comment, one of the stories was about uh, demonstrating at the, at the Ford Rouge and being met by security forces that shot and five people were killed demanding unemployment compensation. Um, and so funeral marchers activities were quite prevalent. But it also sparked what became a real change and kind of began to put the labor movement much closer to the Democratic Party. And the Depression meant that a number of people who had not been Democrats or even hadn't voted, sometimes they were new immigrants, they didn't think they were staying in America, they were going to go home to wherever that might be, Italy, Germany, or, or whatever. Um, or they weren't sure. They were still African American supporter for the Republican Party for ending slavery. But the bread lines, the depression, got many people to rethink about that. And it seemed as though Roosevelt was promising something a little different. This idea of abolishing bread lines, vote for Roosevelt. The notion of the working person, the miner, being closer to President Roosevelt became pretty prominent. And as this cartoon sort of is saying, we demand a new deal, and it's the worker, farmer standing shoulder to shoulder, looking in on Congress, which is kind of uh, behind uh, the speculator, the big business, the uh, politician, um, demanding something a, a little bit different. And Roosevelt gave a series of, of kind of experiments, unique things mm -hmm. that got government involved in, in the economy. This is signing the Social Security Act. Um, uh, but it wasn't just federally, it was uh, at the state level, Frank Murphy, who was the Detroit mayor and an early New Dealer, uh, tried to bring some kinds of improvements uh, here in Michigan. At first, again, just like Roosevelt, it was about relief kinds of things, but later it was about changing some of the laws here, signing a civil service bill into law to try to kind of make work for state government be something that wasn't so um, dependent on who you knew and, and favoritism. Uh, it also meant experiments in the civilian conservation camps and WPA and labor got very much because of these uh, opportunities for people to find work uh, in these different kind of settings uh, much closer to, to the Democrats and especially with Roosevelt. And so the National Labor Relations Act of 35, uh, this notion of saying the president himself would say if he went to work in a factory, the first thing he would do would be to join a union, became kind of the, the theme that the labor people are kind of pressing to say that this new National Labor Relations Board is giving us rights. And of course, as important in the 30s as, as Roosevelt was, was John L. Lewis, you know, the head of the mine workers who then becomes head of the CIO. And, uh, you know, this story goes on and, and we kind of can tell that another time. Um, but um, Lewis, uh, the division between the AFL and the CIO, the, the new auto workers union being part of the, of the CIO, um, is partly about industrial unions and getting these new unions, like this is the beginning of the UAW here. Uh, the next convention gets a little bit bigger and labor marching. Um, rebirth and revival among the AFL, like the Teamsters Union, as I mentioned. There are two labor movements from mid-30s to the mid-50s when the AFL-CIO merged, both kind of competing for, mm -hmm. for the labor person. But more and more their focus becomes this notion of politics. And Roosevelt's re-election in 36 becomes a major kind of concern for them. And uh, so we could go on for quite a while, but um, maybe this with kind of Murphy and, and Roosevelt um, in the 36 uh, campaign would be a good point to stop here. As I was saying earlier, this gives you a, a taste of, of some of the issues and the time um, the show goes on, um, and uh, I will hopefully, uh, when I get this finished, 
have a product that's more like uh, something you could use in a classroom, maybe 45 minutes for the total show, maybe even a, a short 20 minute one too. But the idea is to say something about the history of Michigan and the history of working people and their unions involvement in politics. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we today have pretty much this theme of this sort of vote straight democratic as being what most unions are about and even certain parts of, of the Democratic Party, the, the kind of liberal coalition. But the reality is that that isn't how all labor people and working people have voted for various reasons. They've been angry sometimes at the Democrats or found certain Democrats more supportive and have gone, as the video eventually will say, uh, to sometimes to different parties. They've talked about labor parties or socialist parties, sometimes been closer to the Republican Party or, or than to the Democratic Party. And even in the more modern times, which the, could keep going here, but we'd be going for a couple more hours probably as we went through the 40s through uh, to the uh, uh, last election and maybe even the upcoming election. Uh, there are lots of issues uh, that we can talk about that are important in terms of how working people look at uh, their workplaces and the connections of the workplace uh, to the polling place. So uh, I'm glad to hear that uh, the uh, station is uh, showing the From Calumet to Kalamazoo video that's already uh, out there, which is more generally about unions in the state of Michigan. Uh, it has a little bit about this labor and politics story. Uh, the eventual show will be just focused in on that. Uh, but uh, those that want to see something now or want to uh, contact MSU and obtain a copy, uh, if they're not pirating off of what you're showing on TV, uh, can, can do so. So I want to thank you, Liz, very much for inviting me to, to talk. Thank you so much. Great. That's great. Thank you.